Hey yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to the Old Culture Podcast, where the only map guiding us through this terrain has a hooked X that marks the spot. I'm your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. We've got a bit of a different episode for you this time around. Our guest is Daniel Duke. He's the author of the book Jesse James and the Lost Templar Treasure, Secret Diaries, Coded Maps, and the Knights of the Golden Circle. Dan is also a descendant of Jesse James himself, which we will get into during the chat. And this one is, well, I'd qualify it as something. It is something, because Dan's contention is that the outlaw Jesse James left behind treasure, maps to it, and that the treasure itself might not be material gold that we're hunting for. More on that during and after the conversation. This is the uh, full show for both the free and the Patreon audience, because I just couldn't find a good spot to cut this off. And it's just one of those stories that I think would be even more incomplete without the full context. So put on your discernment caps and make of this one what you will. Daniel Duke is in the house right now. Enjoy. All right, so Daniel Duke, welcome to the show, man. Really appreciate your time and really looking forward to chatting about what we're going to be chatting about here. Thanks. I'm, it's nice to meet you, and I'm honored to be here. Oh, no, 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 man. The honor is all mine, believe me. So you are an ancestor of the famous outlaw, Jesse James, the uh, great-great-grandson. Is that right? That's right. All right. So Jesse was a pretty infamous figure with a hell of a story to tell, and we're going to tell as much of it as we can here. But before we do, I'd like for you to tell us a bit about when you first heard who your great-great-grandfather was, and what it was like growing up with that story and that legacy, for better or worse, with your family. Yeah, that, that's a good, a good question. Well, I first found out when I was a, a child. We would hear rumors, you know, at, at family get-togethers. That, that's usually when those topics really came up. But the story had been passed down through all the generations from Jesse all the way, you know, to me. But uh, when I was a child... I was a a handful anyway for my mother, so she didn't really get too deep into it because I I think she halfway worried that we would do something stupid and try to follow in his footsteps. (laughs) So, so, uh, you know, she kind of toned it down a little, but all my life I've heard the story. And then as I grew older, she told us more and, you know, we had the story. My mother started the research into it just because she'd grown up the same way. You know, they'd always heard about it. People would talk about the gold, the buried gold he had and different, different things about him. But uh, she wanted to know if the history, the traditionally accepted history was true or if the family legend was true. And it, she just she had to know because, you know, it, it bothered her trying to, you know, she she grew up believing one way at the history book said a completely different story. So she had to find out the truth. And that's what began the research. Uh, we had a lot of family photographs that were passed down through the family. And she took the most important photos during her research. You know, if it's true, then the photos of Jesse should match and not just Jesse, but also his family members. So we had photos of Jesse, his brother, Frank, his mother, Zarelda, and his stepfather, Dr. Reuben Samuel. So she took those photos instead of, you know, like a lot of people will, there's a lot of, to be experts in different fields, but she wanted the best she could find. She went to the Texas State, it was a, the, we call it the DPS, Department of Public Safety. They're our tex, uh, state police. So she took it to them, to their uh, forensics experts who are very highly qualified, and they, they verified that our photos matched the accepted, traditionally accepted photos of Jesse and his family members, down to like the photo we had of Jesse's mother. Our family photo, she was wearing the same exact dress in the historically accepted photo down to the same print on the dress. It was really amazing how they, you know, all the the capabilities they have. So she went from them to the Austin Police Department Photographic Forensic Lab. They verified our photos match. And the third group she went to at the time was called Visionics. They were world leaders in facial recognition technology. And they've since been bought out by, an, by another company called Identix. But they, they also verified that our photos match. So that was the big break in, you know, at the beginning in our research, in my mother's research on proving whether or not the, the family stories were true. 
after that, it, it, it boiled down to gathering as much information as we could get, you know, in any document, census records, state and federal records, uh, death certificates, things of that nature. Another big piece we had was uh, Jesse's diary. It wasn't really a diary where he talked about his feelings and thoughts. You know, he just, it was basically a journal where he would log down, you know, the facts that happened each day that ranged from 1871 to 1876. And it listed known gang members and, you know, a lot of other people, which led to a lot more clues. Absolutely, man. And, you know, there's a lot of details there that I just wasn't aware of, obviously. I mean, I knew that that Jesse had probably lived longer than the history books had said, that he had lived under a pseudonym of sorts. I don't think you mentioned the pseudonym there. What was that again? Oh, James Lafayette Courtney. And he went under different, you know, different versions that J.L. Courtney, James L. Courtney. But the, the full name was James Lafayette Courtney, which was actually a cousin of his. It was the name of one of his cousins. So, Yeah, and you actually begin the book then by, by debunking the official death story of Jesse James. And I think we touched on it maybe a little bit there, but could you flesh that out maybe more for us? Yeah, there's a lot more that I didn't add to, to that about Jesse's history, just because my mother had written about it. And my sister and I wrote a second book that's coming out at a later date that, that just you know, focuses on Jesse alone and not the treasures. But, well, you know, Jesse was in the Civil War. Uh, when he was 14, he was too young to fight in the Civil War. It had already been going on. The fighting, uh, a lot of people say the fighting started, the Civil War actually started on the Missouri-Kansas border in the 1850s, like a decade before the, the official war started. So uh, there'd been a lot of fighting. Uh, when the war started, Frank went off to join the Confederate Army Jesse stayed home. He was too young. He was 14. He was plowing in the field and some guerrillas came along and uh, they strapped some union backed guerrillas or they called them Jayhawkers out of Kansas, rode into the field, strapped him to a plow, brutally beat him, rode on to his home, beat his pregnant mother or, or pushed her around. Some, some state that she was tied to a tree and whipped and they hung his stepfather, which didn't kill his stepfather, but it caused permanent brain damage. So, uh, you know, after that, Jesse wanted revenge. He, he was too young to join the legitimate Confederate army, but he found a group that would take him. And they were a very dangerous, they already had a dangerous reputation. It was a uh, Quantrill's guerrillas. And he ended up being very good at, at what they did. He was one of the deadliest guerrillas and uh, they were all deadly. He was one of the deadliest. So that kind of gives an idea of how, I guess his skills, <laughs> but uh, after the war, when he tried to surrender at the end of the war, he was riding into Lexington, Missouri, and they shot. Uh, he was shot. The Union soldiers just opened fire on him. He caught a bullet through the lung. Somehow he lived, and it was basically a choice. Leave the country, get caught and surrender and executed because they weren't, they, they weren't granted amnesty like the normal Confederate soldiers were. So uh, they had no amnesty. If you got caught or turn yourself in, you're going to get executed. And he had a choice, either leave the country or live up to that outlaw brand. And he chose the outlaw brand. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I was, I forgot the original part of your question, and I apologize for that. Well, I just wanted to know, you know, how you were able to debunk the official oh, yeah. death story. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, the photographs right off the bat that my mother had got verified by the experts, and those, you know, they were highly qualified experts. It's hard to, to surpass their level of expertise. So she had that. She thought, OK, you know, the group up in Missouri, they're going to be so excited to find out that Jesse didn't die like history stated. And, you know, she contacted them and was she got a very rude reception. They didn't want to hear any of this. They just blew it off like, oh, another, you know, another crazy person with a crazy story. And it escalated through the years to worse. But she thought, OK, if they're not going to believe it, I guess I need to get more proof. And, you know, she was already researching as much as she could anyway. They had an exhumation in 1995 and, you know, up in Missouri, in Kearney, Missouri, and they were claiming that they proved that Jesse died as history stated, and they did that with DNA. So that was our first, we wanted to, to look at, you know, if this was true, if our story is true and the photos matched, then how could they have proven that he died with DNA? So she started looking into that. I helped her. My sister helped. We found that First of all, the guy they hired for the exhumation that they did in 1995, you would expect a forensic expert, a doctor, 
you know, would be nice. <laughs> and uh, they hired a, he was a law professor from Georgetown University whose hobby was forensics. He wasn't a professional in that field. He dug up the grave and you didn't need to dig the grave up because all you need to do in a case like that is bore a, a small hole into the grave and retrieve a dime sized piece of bone. Well, he made a show out of it, opened up the grave, which was actually fortunate just because they found female bones, female clothes, and male bones all mixed together, none of which they could extract, or they claimed they couldn't extract any DNA from those bones. And the coffin that, that they had exhumed didn't match the coffin that Jesse was said to have been buried in. So a lot, there was a lot of discrepancies and odd, odd findings. You know, why was there a lady in the grave with him? So they couldn't get any DNA. So they decided, okay, We'll get an order from the James Farman Museum, who was said to have had a sample of Jesse's hair and one of his teeth. So they went to, you know, they got a court order to get the tooth and the hair. Well, the Clay County Parks director, whose name was John Hartman, he controlled that. They had an attorney named Stephen Caruso, who at the time was the Clay County commissioner. So Stephen Caruso said he didn't like he didn't like the whole thing. He said it was a tawdry sideshow. He didn't like the way they were going about everything. So he was ordered to submit the hair, which was said to have been Jesse's hair. He didn't like it. So he pulled a hair out of John Hartman's head and put that in the little case and envelope and gave that to him. They thought they were testing Jesse's hair and they were actually testing the Clay County Parks director's hair, which kind of gave me a laugh. But the people who tested it, they acted like, oh, yeah, this goes right along with all the legends of Jesse. <laughs> so, you know, that was kind of a funny, that was yeah. funny to me. They couldn't get any DNA from the hair, though. The tooth they used was extracted in 1978 from the yard of the James Farm, near where the original grave was said to have been, Jesse's original grave, because he was originally buried in the yard, and then they moved to the grave in 1902 to Kearney. Well, in 1978, they, somebody got the idea to dig up the original grave. And they said they found the two, you know, one of Jesse's teeth. There was no proof that it was Jesse's tooth. Along with that tooth was found a hog's tooth, a dog's tooth, and some other animal bones. So being in their yard, that could have been anybody's tooth. It could have been one of the other family members or anybody's. There was no proof and no chain of custody. They kept the tooth that they found in a Tupperware bowl. And it'd been passed around from person to person for years since 1978. Any proof they claim they had is that right out the window. Their story on that has just been blown out of the water. It wasn't professional. There's no proof. And that's what they've hung. They've hung their, like all their hopes and their alleged proof on that, on that story that the exhumation proved it when it actually proved nothing. Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting story, and I'm glad that you guys actually, you know, pursued it until the end there and, and came to your own conclusions that, you know, like you said, were just scientifically more accurate, right? So, yeah. And oh, then there's one, oh, other, there's one other thing. I'm sorry. The law professor, James Stars, who performed the exhumation, he claimed, you know, Zerelda, who was Jesse's mother, was buried right, supposedly buried right next to where Jesse was allegedly buried. If they were testing mitochondrial DNA, and that's what they were looking for, the mitochondrial DNA, which only passes down through the female line. Like you'll have your mother's mitochondrial DNA, but you won't pass it to your children. They should have had the same mitochondrial DNA. But he claimed that the state law of Missouri stated that she couldn't be exhumed because of you know their state law. Well, we found out there's no such law. They were just making up things. And you know, being a law professor from Georgetown University, I would imagine he knew how to verify whether you know, which laws were there and which weren't, didn't even exist. Uh, the law he stated existed, never existed. So there's a lot of questions on why they did certain things and, and all the discrepancies. And basically, they weren't professional about it in any way they went about it. So it just kind of, it leaves a lot more questions than answers. I think that's sort of the the moral of this story, maybe, as we will get through yeah. the rest of it, right? So That's right. But you did say that, you know, once you kind of got through the debunking of that official death story, that you then had more time to focus on coded messages that Jesse had left behind in his diary. and. Yeah that you didn't really think that it was that complicated of a mystery to solve, but you needed to like, you know, drill down to some of the locations and where some of these uh, quote unquote treasures 
may have been buried. So take us through that process, you know, that part of the research. Like once you got after that death confirmation, what then did you have to do to be able to to get into that diary and, and decode some of these messages that you found in there? Yeah, that was, that, and that's a good part of the story. It's one of my favorites. Most every outlaw legend there is, there's always some kind of buried gold or some kind of treasure associated with a lot of the outlaws. And it was the same with Jesse. We had a treasure map that had been passed down through the family. It had a lot of codes, but it didn't have any topography or anything like that on included. It was just a, you know, a, a rectangular shape with a lot of angles drawn in and dashes. And there was some code he'd written in code off to the side. And he also had codes in his diary. So I was always interested in that too. You know, who wouldn't be interested in a treasure story? And I thought, man, it'd be great to find jesse james's treasure even if it's just a jar of silver coins or something it would be awesome Mm -hmm. so uh i I thought at most that's probably what we'd find if anything but it was fun to look for and i got it i wanted to to first determine what the code the code said so you know I, i worked and played around with that and it was actually easy to break it was just he substituted numbers for letters and he would do it forwards and backwards and mix them around, but he would also have letters in the middle of some of the code, which helped a great deal in determining what each word on the code said. So, uh, you know, we had that, it was easy to break that code, but then there was also legend. And at the time I believed, you know, I had no reason to doubt it, that he was part of the Knights of the Golden Circle, which was a secretive group. There were a secret Confederate guerrilla organization who basically during the Civil War, their goal was to cause trouble for the Union, you know, in any way they could, burning bridges, anything. So I thought, okay, no reason to doubt that he would have something to do with a group like that because he was a guerrilla himself. But after the war, they were said to have buried a lot of treasures all over America and even in Canada, according to the legend. And their goal was to use that treasure after they got enough to fund a second Civil War. And I thought, okay, you know, no reason to doubt that. Along with the story comes, uh, there's a treasure template, like how how to find the treasures. And they called it the KGC, Knights of the Golden Circle, treasure template. And I, you know, I found that there's plenty of books and online, it was real easy to find the KGC template. So I had that, it was easy enough to, you know, to figure, well, not to figure out, but it's just, um, you know, the design of it is, is it's not, it didn't look too complicated at first, but I didn't have a scale and you'd need at least two or three locations to figure out what the scale was. And that was the hard part. There was, you know, no topography, no, you know, it's under the Oak tree, go 40 paces North X marks the spot. It was, you had to figure out all these, not just the codes, but the template and the dimensions of it before you could know anything. And I got to working on that. And over time, and this took years to figure all this out, but the former attorney general of the state of Texas, Wagner Carr, he had been talking to my mother about Jesse. He was real interested in Jesse James, too. And in the past, he was following. He he thought maybe another guy was Jesse, but by the name of J. Frank Dalton. That got debunked. My mother debunked that theory. There wasn't any evidence and there was a lot of proof that, no, he wasn't Jesse. But Dalton did know a lot about some of the parts of the stories. And uh, he got a lot of the information, I believe, from my great grandmother, who was Jesse's daughter. He claimed that, you know, he was Jesse five years after Jesse had died. Jesse had died at the age of 97 in 1943. J. Frank Dalton was an old man. He came out with the story in 1948, claiming that he was Jesse, you know, five years later. I think he got that's where the template came from was through Dalton getting it from my great grandmother. There's still a lot of questions there, but that's that's the theory I have right now. But uh, anyway, it was called the KGC template. I needed the locations. Wagner Carr, the former attorney general of the state of Texas, sent his driver out to show my mother and I where the some treasures had been located that had been uh, recovered. And they were very large treasures, according to them. And they showed us. I had those two spots, but the, the template still was kind of, it was hard to figure out. It helped, but it was still, I didn't have it down until an old man named George Roaming, who was also a Freemason, he contacted us. When he was 10 years old, Jesse was an old man. Jesse hired George and swore him to an oath to help him 
move 680 bars of gold, probably about 20 miles from Jesse's house. They loaded up the gold on a, on a large wagon. At the time, it was called a dray. It was like a heavy-duty cargo wagon. They loaded the gold, 680 bars, on the wagon and took it 20 miles away where they met this other elderly gentleman, and they uh, buried the treasure. There was two other boys, according to George, that were there. I believe those boys died during World War II. But uh, George, after that, he went to World the War. When he came back, Jesse you know, had passed away, and he he told us he'd never told anybody about this, but he drew a map for us showing us the location exactly where they buried it, which is now under a lake on Fort Hood property. So it's on military, a military base underneath a lake. So I'd say it's probably very secure. <laughs> so. Yeah. And, it, you know, I always, uh, my, I don't know, my inner red flags raise up when I hear about military properties now, because I always wonder why are these specific locations chosen for yeah. military properties? <laughs> and it's just like, there's tons of stories like this that it just seems rather fishy yeah. to me that these these places are chosen to build bases on that civilians obviously don't have access to. So I've wondered the same thing. I also, uh, I don't know if the treasure was moved before they got the property and turned it into a base, but I don't know if they moved the treasure or used it for some investment or if it's still there. I have no information of it past that point. And it would, I would love to go there, but you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna try that. <laughs> so, <laughs> sure. Um, and I, I wouldn't advise anyone else to try it either. But there's a lot of other locations. When George showed us that location, the other locations that we learned from Wagner Carr and his driver, they fit perfectly. And that is how I got the dimensions of the template. And then I found later that it also, that one template is like one cell out of a, a huge grid. And, you know, it's like a multiple templates that cross, that cover the Americas, in addition to an additional template that's that's in the shape of the tree of life. Yeah, and we will get to that in a moment. I do have some okay. questions about the template, but I want to circle back to the Knights of the Golden Circle. This is a very infamous group, as you said. I don't even know if there's proof that they even existed or that some of the members that were said to be in the group even existed. And I think you actually mentioned this in the book. You know, there are claims that, that for example, um, Albert Pike, a, a famous Freemason and former Confederate general, was a member of the KGC. And obviously Jesse James as well, who you were talking about. But you do say that, you know, you personally have yet to see any proof that these guys were members or maybe even that the group was even real, right? Yeah. Well, I believe they were real, but I don't believe, I think they're their importance has been blown way out of proportion. Uh, you know, it's a secretive group that existed for a short while during the Civil War. And it's easy to make all kinds of claims about a group like that. You know, everybody needs a boogeyman. And uh, there's a, there are some wild claims attributed to them. Some of them may be true, but like you said, I have never seen proof that Jesse, Albert Pike, or some, some other figures were actually members of that group. It wouldn't shock me if they had any dealings during the civil war with them, you know, if their historical records were true, then I would say, yeah, at both sides of any war are going to have secretive groups who, who run around doing covert missions. But after the war, I think their importance has been blown way out of proportion. There's some people who claim they still exist today in treasure hunting circles. And a, a lot of times I wonder if that's not designed to scare people away from certain areas. But uh, that's that's just the only other thing I wanted to add on that. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, treasure hunters are a shifty bunch themselves, so it's hard to yeah. really take them seriously either, uh, to be honest. No offense that's to true. you, you know, because no, you, no. you a, lot of those, yeah. a lot of those guys, I've I've even said it. Most of the one most of the treasure hunters that we've met remind me of modern day pirates. You know, like you said, they're a shifty bunch. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, so back to the template then, you know, you mentioned that you came across this KGC treasure template while trying to identify the location of Jesse's treasure map and researching the KGC for any further clues to, to where this is. And, you know, you mentioned a couple of like interesting, I guess, details about the template. You did mention the, the tree of life and we'll talk about that maybe in a minute. But before okay. we do, you know, you mentioned that there were things in this template, like symbols and things like stars, circles, dots, like things that you would probably find on any treasure map, right? Yeah. yeah. But you also mentioned that there were eight symbols that people refer to as turkey tracks. 
And I'd not seen or heard that term before in relation to treasure maps, so maybe I'm just not as into treasure hunting as I thought I was, but, you know, (laughs) I would be curious to know, like, what turkey tracks actually are and how they played a part in your research and the story here. Yeah, I was the same way. I thought, why would somebody have a turkey track as part, or they call it a turkey track. It it looks, you know, it could have been a bird track of any kind, but the, the term was turkey track, and I thought, this is odd. And there, you know, so, and I thought it has to mean something. And it reminded me throughout my research, I would come across different symbols like ancient rune symbols. And the thing that kind of got me on that was, uh, oh, uh, Scott Walter's hooked X that he had worked on with mm-hmm. the Kensington rune stone uh, that was found up, you know, I think it was Minnesota, Kensington, near Kensington, Minnesota, I believe. They call it the Kensington rune stone. And he had found this hooked X symbol that he said, you know, that he tied and linked with with research he had done to the Knights Templar. So I thought maybe maybe it's a rune symbol, some kind of runic symbol. And I start, you know, I did all this research for years trying to find out what that symbol was. And I found through uh, researching Masonic sources that it ties in with the uh, Egyptian. Basically, it's a form of the tree of life. The Egyptians had a hieroglyph that matches very closely to that symbol. It tied in with the tree of life. They had a hieroglyph that looked like this. And later that morphed into a Fleur de Lis symbol, which is basically just a fancy flowery looking design. That's basically the same thing as the Egyptian hieroglyph that represented the tree of life. The star represented, you know, this five pointed star. I believe that represented Venus as the way the templates line up. There was a lot of information in this that tied in with ancient Egyptian beliefs. Jewish beliefs, uh, Christian, occultic beliefs, uh, all kinds of different religions. Uh, like I'm, I may be jumping ahead on this, but like a grandmaster of the Knights Templar today, Timothy Hogan, he's also an author and lecturer. He has a lot of books and interviews that helped. I, I would pick, you know, find little clues in his, in his writings and his interviews that helped kind of lead me along my journey, gave me great information talking about like Sufi, Sufi mystics, people in the Druze tradition, uh, Muslim, it ties in all these different religions. And that's what made it so complicated at first. But when I started researching like Albert Pike's writings, Manly Palmer Hall's, there were a lot of clues in that that led me to Kabbalah. I started researching more about Kabbalah and sacred geometry. And that's what led me to finding out the meanings of the turkey track. Throughout my research, I found ancient buildings in Europe and uh, the UK where some of the Masons would leave a mark that was identical to the turkeys, the Turkey track from there. I, I thought, okay, this also ties in with Freemasonry, which I, the research, other research had led me to and the Kabbalah. And it all tied in beautifully with that and led me back to the ancient Egyptian hieroglyph, which looked like a Turkey track, but was actually a form of a lily, which represented the tree of life. And I hope I didn't ramble on on that answer, but it, it's, so, <laughs> no. it's so complicated and all the all the different research that that led me to it. It just it took years and I try to quickly describe it, you know, in a quick sentence and it's hard to do sometimes. Yeah, it absolutely is. And I, it was hard for me to to try to form the appropriate questions based off your research. So, you know, I, I told you before we hit the record button here that I was like, you're just going to have to talk at some points of this. So <laughs> I'm glad that you're just doing that. But I think, you know, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I, I just said thanks. And it, yeah, yeah, I can imagine it would be hard to ask questions on it too. Yeah, so. absolutely. But I do want to ask one now that I actually started wondering this as I was working through the book. And, you know, you just mentioned a lot of terms and themes that have popped up on the show here, Kabbalah, sacred geometry, and so on. How familiar with these sorts of things, this occult or, or esoteric knowledge, how familiar with that were you before you started down this research path? I wasn't very familiar with it at all. I mean, I had some, there's a little knowledge. I'd never read about Kabbalah prior to this, to the research. It was very limited knowledge. And a lot, some of these things I'd never heard of in my life. So uh, it was like opening a door to a completely different world. And it, it opens your mind a lot after, after you get into that. The best way I could put that, it was, it, it was extremely enlightening. So Yeah, I mean, I think that's, uh, to say the least, right? It would be yeah, pretty yeah. enlightening. So back to the template then, you know, you said that you got your hands on it and you were trying to figure out what to do with it, how to use it. 
and you realize that you would need at least two known treasure locations to be able to use it correctly. And you hoped, yeah, you hoped that a treasure that was found at a place called Victorio Peak would help unlock the template for you. And this Victorio Peak treasure story, I mean, this is an interesting story in and of itself, and I'd love it if you could tell us a bit about that and then how it did relate back to your research here. Yeah, uh, and I had heard I had heard of Victorio Peak early on in this in my research, just because a lot of people were attributing the treasures of Victorio Peak to the Knights of the Golden Circle. You know, th- there was definitely something found there. That treasure was so big it was mentioned in the Watergate hearings. So I thought, you know, wow, mm-hmm. if it was mentioned in the Watergate hearings, there was definitely something to it. So you know, on researching it further. I found it was discovered by a man named Doc Noss. And Doc Noss, when he found it, at the time he found it, it was illegal for Americans to own gold. So he was trying to hide it, uh, what he'd found. He was trying to sell what he'd found on the black market. And that, you know, that involves a lot of shady characters, you know, naturally. But he had allegedly found all these, you know, a lot of gold, billions, billions of dollars worth of gold. They said the bars were stacked up like firewood through parts of this deep cavern that he'd discovered inside Victorio Peak. And uh, among the other treasures were chests full of like a, a tiara with a pigeon blood ruby, uh, diamonds all over it, all these like something royalty would wear. It looked like royal gems, diamonds, rubies, emeralds, all kinds of other treasures. He found like uh, swords that were encrusted with jewels and stuff like that. And also in in parts of the cavern were uh, skeletons that were still chained to the floor, which sounds like it came right out of a movie. I mean, it's just amazing imagining that. And and also years worth of mail pouches from the Pony Express. And I thought, wow, somebody had been there at least in the 1800s to have done that. So I thought, okay, maybe KGC. But that doesn't explain a lot of the other items. One of the items found in a chest was a 1797 translation from Pope Pius III, who existed centuries before the KGC ever came into being. And it, I mean, even centuries before America was founded. So I thought, okay, that, that doesn't add up with the KGC legend. You know, it, it predates it by centuries. So who, who put this there? And it also cast doubt on the KGC's involvement in this. Another thing about the KGC if they had been involved in this and if their goal was to fund a second civil war, the amount of gold that was said to have been found in Victoria Peak would have more than paid for another civil war. So, you know, they would have taken that and, and gone on with their goals, in my opinion. So there's a lot of evidence about that that discounted, in my mind, any involvement from the KGC. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I thought that was a pretty fascinating thing. And you know, you yeah. mentioned the the note from Pope Pius the Third. I'd like to go a little bit more into that because it has some interesting mentions in it. You know, the seven cities of gold, the legend of Cibola, and then army airmen finding it and what happened after that. So maybe just take us through the story of that note, if you could. Okay, yeah, let me get to that real quick. I want to read the note verbatim, but so Doc Noss said there were Wells Fargo boxes, letter. Let, like the most recent letter that he had he had found in there was uh, 1880. That was the most recent one. The oldest one was dated 1797, and that was the one that bore the translation of the letter from or the note from Pope Pius III. It's a real cryptic letter the way he mentioned it. It was dated September 22nd, 1503. Or actually, that wasn't the date of the letter. The date of the letter was 1797. But Pope Pius III was a pope. He was one of the shortest reigns for a pope in history. He became a pope in 1503, September 22nd, and he reigned until October 18th, 1503. But anyway, the letter he wrote said, seven is the holy number. And that's how the passage begins. Seven is the holy number in seven languages, seven signs and languages in seven foreign nations. Look for the seven cities of gold. 70 miles north of El Paso del Norte, In the seventh peak, Soledad, these cities have seven sealed doors, three sealed toward the toward the rising of the soul sun, three sealed towards the setting of the soul sun, one deep within Casa del Cueva de Oro, which is house of the house of gold, at high noon, 
receive health, wealth, and honor. And that was the end of the translation. But Soledad was said to have been the orig- original name of Victoria Peak. They later named it Victoria Peak in honor of the Apache chief, Victorio. Yeah, okay. So, unfortunately, though, as cryptic as this sounds, and as, as interesting and as cool as it sounds, you actually said that this letter, this treasure cache, was ultimately a dead end. Is that right? Yeah. It, it turned in, well, it wasn't really a dead end. It ties in with, with the, the entire, well, with another template. It was a dead end on the, on the it ended up leading me to the Tree of Life template, which I, I mentioned later in the book. But it wasn't a dead end because it, I mean, it's, it's, it was actually, it was a dead end as far as the researching the KGC and their involvement in this, which in my mind, the, the entire, everything about Victoria Peak ruled out the, the KGC's involvement and led me to start questioning their involvement in any of this. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. So there was something though that was not a dead end, and it was this story of the Bruton Parish Church. And I'd love to give some background on this. In the book, you refer to it as America's Rosalind Chapel, and that's an interesting correlation because if if anybody has went down the uh, Templar treasure rabbit hole, Rosalind Chapel is one of the first and most important landmarks that you come across. So. Where is this church, the uh, Bruton Parish Church, where is that located and what is the historical significance of it? Okay, from Victoria Peak, I kept researching. And that was also around the time I was reading even more, you know, any book I could get from Freemasons that may have been involved in this. And, you know, I ruled them, I ruled out the KGC, but I continued reading more about Kabbalah from Albert Pike, Manley Palmer Hall. And Manley Palmer Hall, uh, for those who don't know, he was a, th- a famous 33rd degree Freemason, and he was an author and lecturer as well. He was married to Marie Bauer, who before they were married, Marie Bauer had been studying or researching legends involving Francis Bacon, codes that Francis Bacon had used in uh, just different ciphers and codes that he had used in his writings and in art that she had found. She was also researching ciphers and codes that she said was tied in with Francis Bacon that were located on tombstones in a cemetery that was part of the uh, Bruton Parish Church in Williamsburg, Virginia, on the East Coast. And I, I thought, wow, you know, if this ties in, how could it tie in? I had no clues to go by other than, you know, it sounded like it vaguely resembled some of the stuff, the other legends I had been uh, researching. And after more reading and looking into it more, it all tied together. Marie Bauer had had deciphered a lot of these codes. She decrypted them while she was working with Francis Bacon and all this, you know, all these other historical characters. She decrypted the codes and discovered that the original church building, which had been attended by a lot of our founding fathers, George Washington, Ben Franklin, and others, she found that they were... Um, there was an original church building and she knew where the foundations were based on the codes that she had decrypted and people laughed at her and they didn't believe her. Well, she proved them wrong. In addition to that, after she proved them wrong about the foundation, she revealed that there was also so, supposed to be a, a deep treasure vault buried beneath the cemetery, right? You know, in the cemetery at the Bruton parish church, but she started to excavate that and she would, you know, that was put to a stop. They, they wouldn't let her go any further and banned her from, from digging there. Well, after that, I, I thought, okay, there, you know, I started digging more into that and the number 1715, that's where that fell in, you know, came into play, into play. I thought just out of curiosity, how far is it from Bruton Parish vault, the location it was said to be to Victoria Peak? It was 1715 miles. And I thought, you know, as I got to looking more, I thought, okay, there's 1,715 miles. That number kept falling in. And I'd seen that number in other places. The Freemasons Grand Lodge in, in England was formed in the, in the year 1715. And I thought, I don't know if this has maybe, I, I had no correlation between 17, 1,715 miles and the Freemasons Grand Lodge being formed in England at that time. I thought that'd be a wild stretch. So. As I kept researching it, I found that the uh, the location of the vault is 1,715 feet from the Bruton Parish Cemetery to the, the old building at uh, William and Mary College, 
you know, right down the street from them. It's just 1,715 feet. And that number kept popping up in a lot of different ways when I was researching this. So that led me back to Kabbalah and Gematria, which is employed a lot with Kabbalah in Jewish, Christian, and occult Kabbalah. And I found that the, the number 1715 can be tied in with the tree of life and also can be translated as meaning behold the tree of life. So that was a huge clue for me on that. And not just that. I, when I found that, I thought there's a lot of coincidences here. Maybe there's something to it. I don't know. But if there is something to it, it should show up in other ways. So I got to, I started, you know, I measured uh, different parts of the Tree of Life template, like from Victoria Peak to one of the recovered sites near Georgetown, Texas. It was 548 miles long, which can be uh, broken down into four times 137. Well, the number four in Gematria is translated as door. And the number 137 is a huge number. It ties in with the fine structure constant said by some physicists to be, you know, one of the the numbers that can be a key to unlocking a lot of mysteries on the level of string theory and things like that. But in Gematria, 137 is the the, uh, Gematria of the word Kabbalah. So I had these distances and numbers that that kept tying back into Kabbalistic terms like behold the tree of life and door to Kabbalah. And those those were were very big clues in cracking this this mystery. Yeah, you mentioned in the book that the uh, Bruton Vault was the granddaddy of all campfire tales, and yeah, exactly. just from that little explanation there, it's easy to see why. And you mentioned Francis Bacon during that, and you know he's a name that's popped up on the show before in a couple different instances, and he has connections to obviously uh, modern science and Freemasonry and the Rosicrucians as well. Some even think that he may have been the true author of the Shakespearean works, and it's really an interesting rabbit hole to go down, you know. And and we yeah. went down that many times here on the show too and the Rosicrucians who I mentioned there too have come up on the show a lot too and they've only come up on the show in the esoteric or metaphysical sense but it turns out that in your book you actually say that they had another like maybe more practical role as it pertained to where these treasures may have wound up do you remember what that role was yeah they uh they play a very important role in this too and I'm I'm glad you brought that up because I don't want to leave them out of this before Freemasons were a, you know, modern day Freemasonry was said to have been founded by Francis Bacon. Francis Bacon was also said to have been a Rosicrucian, as were many others during the Renaissance period. They had a lot of secret knowledge. They were part of the same story. I believe, you know, Francis Bacon was a Rosicrucian. He had his fingers in a lot of things, alchemy, Rosicrucianism. He's said to have been the founder of Freemasonry, modern day Freemasonry, but I believe they existed for, you know, long before that just in different forms. The Rosicrucians were also known as the Navigators. I learned a lot of that from um, the writings and essays of a Rosicrucian today is a well-known one. His name is Peter Dawkins. And uh, researching Peter's writings also led me to to a lot of other clues that I'd put in my book and and discoveries that I had made. Just uh, his writings about Oak Island, the treasure that's said to have been located at Oak Island uh, the Rosicrucians were known as the as the navigators. They were kind of like, a, in my opinion, an elite group of mystics and alchemists. Uh, that that's a very simple way to to describe them. They had the, they had a lot more. There was a lot more to it than that. They also had a a lot of knowledge, and they were known as the uh, the Invisible College. Uh, there's a lot of, a lot about that, and uh, you know when you start researching alchemy. Rosicrucianism and even Freemasonry, you, I came across the Invisible College and mentions of that a lot. They, they'd even had colonies here in the Americas early on. They played a very important role in forming or in, in bringing about the formation of the United States, the colonies and the United States. I hope I explained that well. They, they, they get, it get, you can get extremely deep in those topics, and I hope I'm doing them justice in the way, you know, in my book and in the way I'm describing it. Sure, sure, absolutely. And you know, speaking of Bacon, though, like you mentioned him in the book, but you also mentioned Queen Elizabeth the First. You mentioned her in relation to Francis Bacon and some, you know, potentially yeah. interesting connection that they actually may have to each other. What was that connection exactly? Francis Bacon is said to be Queen Elizabeth the First's son. 
A lot of people believe it. it's it's a controversial topic, but as you can imagine, especially when it's such an important historic to his you know important historical figures, there's a lot of controversy involving the and secrecy involving the life of Francis Bacon himself. Marie Bauer Hall had mentioned that, and a lot of other authors that uh, Francis was her son. I believe the father was Robert Dudley, or said to have been Robert Dudley. And they had they had spent a lot of time throughout their life together. Robert Dudley and Queen Elizabeth were said to be Francis Bacon's parents. And there's there's a lot there. So I, I can't discount that at all. There's a lot of people who claim they don't. They weren't. That's that's false. But there's also a lot, a lot of evidence that historians have found that point towards the fact that it may be true. Now, if that is true, then that means that or maybe it doesn't mean. But is it likely that the queen herself is connected to this treasure story as well? There's a possibility. I, I don't know, and I don't know how you would find proof of that, but it, she could be. I, I've often wondered about that. I also wondered if maybe, you know, he couldn't be included in his his rightful birthright, so maybe he had reason to go other ways and form an, his own new country, or at least, in, in my opinion, with all the work he had done, he had written a book titled The New Atlantis which was is said by many and if you read if you ever read the new atlantis by francis bacon the portions that are available today it it's like a perfect description of america the new world especially when it was first founded and uh, i i've often wondered if maybe you know I, I don't know but i've wondered if maybe he 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 couldn't have his rightful birthright so maybe he had maybe that steered him towards forming a country that you know, that that could be a huge accomplishment on his part that he was responsible or played a big role in was forming their own country. Yeah, definitely. I hope, I hope that Go made ahead. sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we've all maybe not we all have, but, you know, we've been down that sort of stuff on the show before with some other guests. So it should be familiar to most of the audience here. And, you know, one more thing about this Bruton vault or this Bruton vault you said that the logo used by the Bruton Parish Church Foundation bears a striking resemblance to the KGC template. I don't know if we outlined that yet, but what was the similarity between the logo with this church foundation and the template that you were working with? Yeah, the template, they had a window. It's a window that's been used for years on, on, their, on the Bruton Parish Church. It was on the east facade of the Bruton Parish Church. And that one was made, I believe, in 1750. Yeah, 1752 when that the east facade came into existence but the window on that they used looks very similar i mean if you lay the template the so-called kgc template over that window it's very easy to see the similarities between the two you know symbols are used in a lot of different ways and most people who saw the window would think oh that's you know a nice window a lot of people wouldn't even pay attention to it uh, it's the kind of window you'd expect to see on a church but the way it's designed looks very similar, strikingly similar to the to the KGC template, which I now refer to as the veil template. Yeah, and we'll get to the veils, I think, uh, in just a moment. But oh, hold on a second. We'll actually get to the veils right now because that is the next part of my notes here. So this section in the book that you have a, a chapter titled The Three Veils, and man, I'll be honest, it got a bit heady at times. And it's kind of hard to summarize without actually just working through the material in the book as you lay it out. But here we are on an audio podcast. We have to describe this as best as we can in words without visuals. So take us through what this section is about, this Three Veils, what the Three Veils term actually refers to, and again, how it relates back to the treasure hunt here. Okay. What I had thought of as a KGC template, and you know, most people had termed, you know, labeled it the KGC template. I actually refer to it as the veil template now after my research and discounting the involvement of the KGC. The template, one cell of the template is a square with two circles, one large circle on the outer boundaries of the square. The square is turned on, on its corners. So, you know, each corner of the square points roughly to the cardinal directions, like, you know, imagine north, south, east, and west, lay the corners of the square so they point to the directions. And, you know, you've got your square, uh, the circle on the boundaries of it, and then there's an inner circle that's halfway between the center of the square and the outer boundary of the square. That, that's where the inner circle lies. And the turkey tracks that we'd mentioned earlier, there are eight of them, and they surround the outer edge and the inside of that inner circle. 
along with dots and there's also squares. There's a square in the center of the large square and a small square on the, in the, within the corners of each of the squares on the large square. Well, that, as I'd mentioned earlier, that's just one cell of the template. And if you just basic, you, you line the templates up next to each other and it makes a huge grid and it literally does cover the Americas. It lines up with historically known sites and also known treasure locations throughout the Americas. The Kensington Runestone, for example, that Scott Walter had worked with, uh, the Newport Tower, Oak Island and the areas around that, and a lot of other sites, uh, the, the Los Lunas Decalogue Stone in New Mexico. So it makes a grid system. And in researching this further and researching Kabbalah, when I discovered the Tree of Life template and the way that that lines up, it touches, there's a, a two spots on the Tree of Life template that line up perfectly with the Veil template. But I didn't, you know, I didn't know it was the Veil template at the time. I just knew it lined up with the grid. And I thought, how can, how are these connected? Why would they have two templates, two separate templates, but they're connected? I didn't understand that. And I needed to find out if they were connected at all. Or if for some odd reason, I'd stumbled on two amazing treasure stories that weren't related. Uh, I found out later they are related. And the way I found that out was reading deeper into Kabbalah. With the Tree of Life, there are what they call three veils of negative existence. And those are associated with the Tree of Life. Uh, one is the uh, veil of boundless light. The other is called the boundless. And then the third veil is called nothing. That's roughly translated from the Hebrew words, but there's three veils in association with the tree of life. And during my research, I'd also found within each cell of the, the entire grid, there are three sizes of template. There's a large, medium, and small, and that lines up perfectly with the beliefs in, you know, regarding the tree of life in the various forms of Kabbalah. I hope that was a good description of that. Hey, it's better than I could do. So okay. <laughs> that's that's good. <laughs> you know, there is an interesting mention here, though, of a figure known as Falconelli. You mentioned him or oh yeah, whatever Falconelli is, him or her or them or whatever. You mentioned yeah. that name in this chapter. And I was just curious, like, that's an interesting name to come across. And I came across that several years ago. And it's one of the mysteries that set me down this path, to be honest. And I was just curious, you know, like, just from what you could tell from coming across that name, you know, who was Falconelli as you understand the term? And how did actually the work that was done under that name relate back to your research here? Okay, as I'd mentioned, the Veil template, it makes a crisscross pattern. You know, if you zoom out on the map, or if you're drawing it, you know, if you see it on a map or or even an art, I found out this crisscross pattern. I wanted to know more about the veil and the symbolism because so many other things that tied in with this didn't just tie into Kabbalah. It also ties in with other beliefs and cultures. And uh, a lot of these seem to be, the, these symbols seem to spread out as well through other beliefs and cultures. So I wanted to know the meaning, you know, what does it mean? What does it stand for? Everything I could find on these. And I came across the writings of this man named Fulcanelli. And that name, just just like you, you mentioned, the name catches your attention. It's like, it sounds mysterious, and, and it just kind of draws you in just with the name alone. So I wanted to know more about him. And it turns out he was an author. He was said to, be an, said to have been an alchemist. And I thought, well, a lot of this ties in with alchemy. I need to read more about this guy. And he'd written a book called The Mysteries of the Cathedrals. Some of the passages in that tie in perfectly with the veil and the meanings behind the veil. Uh, he also had other meanings like scallop shells and stuff like that that are found, which I've been researching more recently. But with the veil, if you'd like, I could read what his description of the, of the crisscross pattern translates to. Absolutely. Please do. Yeah. He said, uh, well, in his book, The Mystery of the Cathedrals, he was talking about a, a there's a, a carving of a figure called Ophorus. And there was Ophorus was a legend about a giant who carried Christ across a swollen river. And to make a long story short, I'll just get into his explanation. On Ophorus's belt, there was a crisscross design. And it, it says, you know, Ophorus's belt is marked with crisscross lines, like those seen on the, on the surface of the solvent when it has been prepared according to canon law. 
and the solvent deals with is uh, uh, alchemical practices. This is the sign recognized by all philosophers as marking exteriorly the intrinsic value, the perfection and extreme purity of their mercurial substance. I've already said several times, and I will repeat again, that the whole work of the art consists in processing this mercury until it receives the above mentioned sign. And this sign has been called by the ancient authors, the seal of Hermes, the seal of the wise, cell de sages, cell salt being put instead of scale, seal, which confuses the mind of seekers. The mark of the imprint of the Almighty, his signature, also the star of the Magi, the pole star, etc. And uh, he went on to say the secret version, the secret version of this positive truth in the Epiphany cake, which it is the custom for families to eat at, at Epiphany, the famous feast marking the man- manifestation of the Christ child to the three Magi kings and to the Gentiles, it is the child Jesus carried by Ophrys, the servant, or the traveler. It is the gold in its bath, the bather. It is the bean, the sabo, the cradle of the cross of honor. And it is also the fish which swims in our philosophical water. Which, I mean, that's, that's a lot to say in, you know, two paragraphs. It, it's mm-hmm. very deep and very informative. That's what, you know, it led me to believe it wasn't just representative of the three veils on the tree of life. It was also representative of, of the alchemical texts, which ties into Rosicrucians, Freemasonry, and it goes back. Yeah, it, it's uh, again, like I said, quite heady stuff to dig into. But you know, ultimately, it's thought provoking at the least. You know, to to see how this all connects with each other. And there's another interpretation here, or sorry, there's another text here uh, that you referenced around this section too. Is this uh, paper titled Passing the Veils, Ceremony and History by Gordon Mogg. I hope I'm saying that right. But you wrote that he observes that in early ceremonies, and I'm not really sure what ceremonies he's talking about, but maybe you can expound on that in a minute. But in early ceremonies, that veils were three in number. And then he notes that, that there's a Kabbalistic text called the Book of the Greater Holy Assembly that refers to the three veils of negative existence. What the hell does that mean? Because I don't know anything <laughs> about that. Yeah, it's uh, it gets really deep into the tree of life, Kabbalistic beliefs, and there's a lot of there's still a lot that's uh, it's hard to explain sometimes. But when it all starts clicking, you know it, and, and you you just want to learn more. Well, like earlier when I was talking about uh, well, when I read Fulcanelli's quote about the veil, the crisscross lines, he mentioned traveler and Mercury. I think this also ties in with ancient Greek. Well, ancient Greek and Roman mythology, Mercury was known as the traveler. There's a lot of famous paintings like from Nicholas Poussin and others. And even on the pilgrimage to Santiago, it was called the Camino de Santiago in France and Spain. There's scallop shells. They use scallop shells as a symbol of their pilgrimage. And I thought, where did these, where'd this legend for scallop shells come along? That's also mentioned in some of Fulcanelli's writings. The scallop shell it's pre-Christian and ties in with ancient Roman and Greek mythology and also alchemy. It ties in Mercury, Traveler, Venus, all the different various beliefs that surround them. When you look at that, there's also artists that use that, like Luke, Lucas Cronach the Elder, who ties in Mercury, Venus, and it, it ties in, I believe, in, in some beliefs with the belief that Jesus and Mary had a child. Uh, they tie a lot of these figures in. And in a way, I think they used a lot of this because back in those days, if you said something, oh, if, if you said the wrong thing, you could easily lose your head. The Catholic Church had a, you know, had a strong hold on a lot of this stuff and anything that got out. So they had to hide it in art and symbolism. And I think that's another reason why a lot of it gets so mysterious and deep. What was the rest of your question on that? Oh, Gordon Mogg. Yeah, yeah, Mogg, yeah. You know, Mog had said that in early ceremonies, the, the veils were three in number. I'm not really sure what the ceremonies refer to, unless those are like maybe Jewish mystical ceremonies that go with Kabbalah. And then he also notes that he references this Kabbalistic text, the Book of the Greater Holy Assembly, refers to these three oh, veils yeah. that you mentioned as the three veils of negative existence. And I was just curious if you knew what any of that meant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the veils of negative existence, um, well, from what I can tell, Right now, it you know, other than being part of the template, uh, that's what helped me dis- discover the meaning behind the template. But the veils of negative existence deal with, you know, 
in a Christian and Hebrew beliefs and other beliefs, uh, God in the beginning, God, there was said to have been nothing. So God represents nothing or no thing. Uh, that was one of the veils. He, was, he also represented the boundless, the infinite, and also boundless light. So there were three, three definitions of the three veils, and each veil had its own meaning, which was an attribute that they had tied to trying to describe the nature of God. And also Gordon Mogg, when he had mentioned that, they changed their, like with the Masons, Freemasons, they changed, they've, throughout history, some of their ceremonies have changed over time. Uh, some of them stay the same. Some lodges will get, you know, they'll change and while, while other lodges and other regions will, will keep with the old traditional ways. But their lodges, the meanings on the veils with a lot of the Freemasonry, I believe, tie back into not only Kabbalah and the, the mention of the, the veils of negative existence, but they also tie in with the temple in Jerusalem and the temple of Solomon. In that temple, if you read through biblical accounts and other accounts, there were said to have been three veils in the temple where there was one separating the temple, you know, the outer court from the inner court or from the entrance. Then there was another one between the two other courts and then between the inner court and the uh, Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was located, there was the third and the final veil. So it, it had literal meaning and spiritual and philosophic meanings behind it. Man, how long did you research this stuff? Because your retention of this is pretty impressive, I have to say. Thanks, I appreciate it. It's been years, 20 years, and a little longer, actually. But you know, when I first started getting big clues on the treasure, it started 20 years ago. And you know, That's amazing, yeah. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a book you mentioned, too, in this part of your book called Gates of Light that I'd not heard of before. And I'm just curious why this book was significant to your research and worth the mention here. When I first started, I wanted to know, you know, after I discovered the Veil and Tree of Life templates and started reading about Kabbalah and all of that, I wanted to know who did this, who came up with this stuff. It was amazing to me. And I wanted to know who, you know, who was responsible. Was it Freemasonry or was it one person? I didn't know. Well, researching Freemasonry and Kabbalah and all of that led me to Francis Bacon. And Francis Bacon, when I came, when I stumbled upon that part of it, I thought, okay, this is the guy who started it all. He was obviously a a genius or beyond that in some cases. It's hard. Genius doesn't even seem to give him enough credit, in my opinion. But uh, I thought, okay, this is the guy. He was a genius, crazy genius. You know, he wasn't crazy, but it was just crazy amounts of genius. I thought this is the guy. But then later on, I started reading more and I thought, this isn't the guy. Uh, he, he played a very important part of it. But I wanted, you know, I was just, I kept coming across clues that it led even further back than Francis Bacon. So that led me to John D., Francis Bacon's mentor, who was the first 007. And, you know, he was an alchemist and, and he was a genius in his own right. It was said to have come up with the Enochian alphabet, the Enochian language in some of his work. But going from him, he tied back into other people. I mean, there's so many people. It was like a family tree of people involved in this. And it led, for, for example, like John D. He studied and was close friends with Gerolamo Cordano. And I hope some of these names, I'm sure with my Texas accent, I'm not pronouncing them correctly. <laughs> okay. But, but uh, Gerolamo Cordano, he was uh, whose father, his father was a friend of Leonardo da Vinci. So, you know, there, I wanted to know if there were any verifiable ties that could link people back to finding the source involved in creating all of this. And uh, so, you know, from Leonardo da Vinci, his, he, his father's name was Fazio, Fazio Cordano. No, G- Gerolamo's, Gerolamo's father was Fazio Cordano, who was friends with Leonardo da Vinci. And from him, it goes back to, you know, from Leonardo da Vinci to a guy who, he and a, a man named Johann Ruklin were students of John Ahiropoulos, who was a teacher and, and a, a mystic in 1415. He lived from 1415 to 1487. That ties back to Maximilian I. Uh, there's connections with them because Paolo Riccio, who ties in with this, he was uh, not only an, a scholar, 
he was also the person, one of the personal physicians to Maximilian I, the emperor, Maximilian. Paolo was a Jewish man who converted to Catholicism. And I'm not sure if he was, you know, if he was given a choice, convert or die, as a lot of people were in those days, or, or if he did it willingly. I have no proof on that. But Paolo Riccio had translated an ancient or an older Jewish text titled, which translates to the gates of light. It's a Kabbalistic text. He had translated it into Latin and the name was uh, Porte Lucis. Well, on the cover of Porte Lucis, the, the cover caught my eye because there's a drawing of a man who I believe is probably Abraham Gikatilla, who was the author of the original Jewish work. I think it's a portrayal of him. He's pointing at the floor. He's wearing on his shawl a uh, design that's a crisscross pattern, which ties into Fulcanelli and the veil template. He's pointing at the floor on the floor. It looks like water where he's pointing. And it's also, he looks like he's dressed for travel. Well, the tiles on the floor in the illustration perfectly match a world map of, from that time period. The book was written in 1516. The world map I used was dated 1524 and it lines up perfectly with the boundaries of the new world, including the United States eastern coast, the coast of Central America, all the way down to the northern portions of South America. And, you know, he's holding a tree of life in one hand. He's pointing at the floor, which suggests, you know, he looks like he's dressed for travel. He's pointing at, you know, at the direction he's traveling. He's holding the tree of life. And it all seemed to spell out that, you know, Tree of Life, New Land, they were heading towards a place where they were very, if you read the history about the Jews and other groups, they were persecuted horribly throughout the centuries. And, any, you know, alchemists, anybody who believed differently from the Catholic Church at the time, they were horribly persecuted, killed, burned, all kinds of stuff. And I think they were pointing, you know, here's the new world. That's our dream. You know, and it was like a, a symbol also, in my opinion, for the Tree of Life template that I discovered here in, in the United States. In addition to that, the guy in the illustration, who I believe is Abraham Gigatilla, he's sitting on a chair that matches the hooked X symbol that Scott Walter had written and worked on so much, uh, which he'd tied in with the Knights Templar. So that led me down you know, further, tying people in like Abra Abraham Gigatilla back to through different ra uh, rabbis, Jewish rabbis, who were all related through blood or marriage or, or professional associations to uh, a rabbi named Rashi. Oh, that was his nickname, the Rabbi Rashi, uh, who happened to be the favored court guest of Hugh, the Count of Champagne, who was one of the founders of the Knights Templar. And that is when I thought, finally, you know, it was like the end of the trail, as far as I know, that it goes back and it shows a clear line, a clear connection of like the same philosophical beliefs and the same dreams for a new a place they could all share their ideas, speak their mind, liberty and freedom, the whole ball, uh, without having to worry about losing their heads. And you know, there it was pointing to America, and it also tied in with all the treasures, and it, it helped a great deal in explaining where the treasures originated, or at least some of them. Yeah, I mean, it's such a fascinating story on all levels. It just goes so deep. And at some point, it just seems like, well, I was just gonna make a comment that I actually want to say till the end. So we'll okay. hold that thought. But yeah, you mentioned that you at some point in your own research had to really show that line of succession that tied everything back to the Templars. You just sort of touched on that there. But let's maybe try to go a little deeper with that. What did your research actually uncover about, you know, how much the Knights Templars as a group may have actually had to do with this? Because they're connected to, you know, a lot of these treasure stories throughout history. They're connected to the, the Oak Island mystery, which you referenced earlier. Obviously, mm -hmm. Scott, Scott Walter's work on that what was that show called? America Unearthed, I believe, that, that he was doing yeah, the History think, Channel yeah. for a while. Yeah, and so th this is a very fascinating group. It's, I mean, it's one that's obviously been discussed on the show here and on plenty of other shows, too. So the audience should be familiar with who they are in general. But, you know, they were the original bankers, too, from what I understand, or maybe part of that yeah. network. But what did you really discover about, you know, who they might have been and, and how they tie into Jesse James? Because that's a weird connection to make, you know? It, it really is, and I'm glad you asked that. At first... If if I hadn't done all the research, I would have thought, you know, this is a, a wild, crazy story, <laughs> so, and I would have left it at that. But doing the research on it, it all ties in beautifully. Jesse, you know, he when he 
he faked his death. A lot of people don't know that he wanted, he tried to fake his death earlier in 1879. And that is very well documented. Uh, he and one of his gang members tried to fake his death. They couldn't, you know, they didn't have a body. They just made a blood trail, I think with some animal blood, they probably shot a deer and left a trail of blood and wanted people to believe that, yeah, he got away, but he surely did. Uh, it didn't work. And then his cousin, who I believe, believe it was his cousin, Wood Height, who bore a very strong resemblance to Jesse. He died. He got shot in a fight. I think he was passed off as Jesse. Another man who died was buried in an unmarked grave and was passed off as Wood Height. To this day, nobody can point to where Wood Height's grave is. There's that. He faked his death. We know through all the evidence and the research that my mother and I have done, Jesse faked his death, came to Texas and lived his life to be an old man. Well, when he was in Texas, he was a Freemason. I know for a fact, I don't know if he had had any access to Freemasonry before he had faked his death, but I know definitely there's records, there's proof. He was, he was a Freemason and you know, the lodge that he joined is in existence today. So um, that ties him in with Freemasonry and then tracing everything from Freemasonry back tied into Francis Bacon, John D, the the rabbis, uh, various, you know, all the way to the Templar. And not only that, the treasures that Jesse had is known to have buried. And we, you know, the guy, uh, George Roman drew the map for one of them. There's others. The place he lived is part of the template. It all fits on this template that also ties in with all the other treasures that were known of that have, you know, verifiable records of being in existence and all the treasure and historical market markers that we know of. So that, that was proof, just more proof showing that Jesse's connection uh, with Freemasonry and their connection with the treasures and how they all tie in beautifully, in my opinion, and help just both. It's more evidence that to, to the veracity of my story, the Templars involvement, as you know, they were on October 13th, 1307, the Catholic Church and the French King turned against them, raided them. It was a morning raid. And when they got there, they expected all this wealth to be in the, you know, in the building that they raided or the compound. And there was nothing, nothing at all. Just a few Templar who were left behind. All the other Templar were gone. Their ships that were harbored had disappeared sometime in the night. And a lot of people including myself, believe that the Templar took their treasures then and probably earlier than that from where they were to to Scotland and from there to likely Oak Island. There's too much evidence showing that they've been here in America and to Oak Island and along the uh, eastern coast to discount the fact that they, they were here. I think they got the treasures from from not only like Timothy Hogan, who is the current Grand Master of the Knights Templar had stated in some interviews that, as I'd mentioned, Rashi was a favored guest of, of Hugh, the Count of Champagne, who was one of the founders of the Templar. They got sacred knowledge. They knew the Crusades were coming. A lot of people try to lump the Templar in with the Crusaders, but the Crusaders were came after the Templar had already had access to people and historic and spiritual objects in the Middle East. Their job, they knew war was coming. They knew the Crusades were unavoidable. One of their missions was to enter the Holy Lands, secure these treasures and historic and spiritual items, and protect them from the war that was, was you know, bound to happen. So in my opinion, they didn't only take the treasure, they're the custodians of this. Yeah, they are all over these stories. Their handprints are for sure. And I want to circle back, though. You know, you mentioned that Jesse was a Freemason down there in Texas and yeah. the lodge still exists. Now, does the lodge recognize him as a former member? His alias uh, as James L. Okay. Courtney is recognized as a as a, uh, a member. OK, but now you also said that that alias was the actual name of a cousin of his, too, right? That's true. But everybody who knew him. Uh, even today, there are several Masons I know of today. All the old timers and even Freemasons in that area know who he, that he was actually Jesse James. They okay. know his identity. All the old timers there know it. Some of them won't admit it, but a lot of them do, thankfully. And uh, the proof that we have that, you know, I don't know what became of his cousin. His cousin just kind of disappeared. And there's a lot of mystery about that. I mean, you can, there's theories I have on that, but that he, pretty much just disappeared after that happened. 
His cousin was went by the same name. I found records that he married a lady in Kansas and just dropped off the face of the earth as far as records go. I don't know if he was killed or what became of him. Hmm. That's another, I guess, uh, rapid hole that we could go down for sure. Yeah. But well, I don't have any information his, on that. So yeah, ahead. his description doesn't even match Jesse's description. So there's, uh, I mean, there were Jesse had sandy hair. Uh, sometimes he would color it darker, but the the original J.L. Courtney had black hair, and his height didn't even match Jesse's. So there, there's a lot of differences they had. Plus, the original his cousin J.L. Courtney was a uh, Union soldier. So, okay. and I mean, what bet? What better if you're hiding from the very people who have been trying to find and kill you? What better way to hide than disguised as a Union, a former Union soldier? And that did cause a lot of trouble for him in his part of Texas after he relocated here uh, because people thought he, you know, they'd call him a Yankee. And, and uh, you know, right after the war, a lot of those, the, he moved into an area that was highly heavily populated with former Confederates. So, you know, it, it caused a little trouble. <laughs> uh, there's, <laughs> yeah. there's, there's even stories surrounding that. Um, somebody tried, they tried to ambush him at one time. Another time riders in the night showed up to his house and something, the way he told them he would be right out somehow scared them and they all rode off. So I, I, I would have loved to have been there. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I always, you know, have told people that one of my favorite parts of American history that I would have loved to have lived through was that, you know, that old Wild West era in like the late 1800s. It's same, just such a fascinating, here. it's just such a fascinating time period, you know, to just like, it seems weird to say, but it, it makes like train robbing seem very fun and like glorified, you know, it, it just, it, it kind of glorifies it all these things that we've been told like, well, we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't steal from other people. But then again, I'm like, well, eh, if we're stealing from banks or, you know, rich people like that, well, maybe it's okay on some level, especially if you need it. But hey, I'm not, I'm not advocating yeah. that here. I'm just saying, you know, I'm just saying. So yeah, I, I agree completely. Absolutely. So uh, let's get back to the we're kind of like nearing the latter part of the book here. So let's just get back to the end of this treasure hunt. You know, you mentioned earlier that whoever was, you know, putting together these maps or these, these alchemical treasure maps, I guess, whether it was the Templars or the Rosicrucians or whoever else that, you know, they would code symbols into various different things. And one of the things that they use was art. And you actually mentioned a piece in the book that I'd love for you to tell us about. It's called the Arcadian Shepherds. I'm just curious yeah. if you could tell us about that piece of art and how it ties into the research here. Okay, I'm sure you're familiar with Holy Blood, Holy Grail, and you know the, mm -hmm. the, the movies that have spurned, the movies that have come out of that. And Arcadia Ego is also, you know, the, also called the Arcadian Shepherds by N Nicholas Poussin. I, I knew from reading, you know, the research and also reading uh, Holy Blood, Holy Grail that that painting played a, a large role in this story. Well, I, I remember coming to a dead end at some point. You know, uh, it was as you're researching things like this, you come to a lot of dead ends and you're and roadblocks and walls that you eventually luck. Fortunately, I found my way through or around in this case, while I was at, at a stopping point on part of it, I wanted to look into those paintings. A lot of the mentions of it started looking like the story was starting to sound a lot like Holy blood, Holy grail to me. And I thought, well, I'll take a look at this painting just to see if there's anything. And I, I'll, I, I just have fun looking at a lot of this old art. I got to looking at it and I, I recognized, you know, Nicholas Poussin was a master painter and there's no question that he was a master painter. Everybody, you know, all the experts around the world admit and claim that he was a master painter and someone with that kind of skill, you know, he would know about shadows and, and angles of light and things of that nature. So I got, I noticed the shadow on the tomb they're pointing at in that painting. And I thought that's kind of odd. The shadow isn't matching the angle, like his elbow, where the shadow of his elbow doesn't match the, the angle of light with the shadow of his knee. And uh, one of the guys carry, or there's several, two other men in the painting, they're, they're holding staffs. One of the guys, the staff should show a, a, a shadow. There's no shadow at all. So I got to looking at all these discrepancies and oddities that I, I found odd. And I noticed the shadow looked like the symbol of a heart like a, you know, a human heart or not the human heart, but like a Valentine's heart. And I thought, well, a heart is a treasure symbol. And for a while I thought maybe he was talking about a heart. That's a symbol, you know, another treasure symbol. But later on, I realized it looked more like the musical instrument, a harp, you know, 
a harp and he's pointing at the letter R on the tomb. And I know there's a style of harp called the R harp. And I thought, wow, this is interesting. Uh, also around that time, I was reading the writings of uh, uh, Peter Dawkins, the Rosicrucian. He's also an expert on Francis Bacon. And he'd written an essay about Oak Island and how the constellation Cygnus plays a large part of that, a lar large part of the treasure legends in the Templar connection with Oak Island. So that that gave me a huge clue. I start, I thought, OK, if that plays a part in this, could that possibly have anything to do with my findings and also this painting? Well, it ties in with uh, the constellation Lyra. The constellation Lyra looks like in some cultures, in Muslim cultures, they used to call it like a vulture. Uh, other cultures recognize Lyra as an eagle. It ties in with Greek and Roman mythology, Orpheus. He played such beautiful music that he would charm even the rocks and the trees. It ties in with his legends and the, the myth on that, you know, after Orpheus was killed, Zeus put his, his lyre in the skies and turned it into a constellation. Well, that constellation and Peter Dawkins' writings led me to uh, Cassini's Celestial Globe of 1792, which places the lyre that, you know, the constellation Lyra right over the heart of the Midwest here in the United States, which ties in with the Tree of Life as well. It just keeps going. The symbols, not only Lear, but all the figures in the, the painting, the Shepherds of Arcadia, tie in with known constellations like Hercules bowing before Zeus. Zeus was also known as an eagle. That ties in with Lyra, which is an eagle in the, you know, an eagle with a harp. It all tied in beautifully with the constellations, Greek and Greek and Roman mythology, and, and the, the whole ball of wax. When I discovered that, it was one of those moments. It, it was very surreal. Like, I wasn't even really there. I was in a dream. <laughs> so it, it felt odd, but it all ties in beautifully. I kept looking at it and wondering, could I be wrong? But all these other experts mm -hmm. are saying things that also tie in with this. If you take all the research as a whole, it all ties in with it as well. And it all fits beautifully. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy. Some of the stuff like, you know, you do have a lot of visuals and diagrams in the book, like that's what makes this easier to sort of follow along with. And that's why I said earlier, like, it's really hard to describe some of this verbally in words without the visuals to go along with it. So I mean, that is the value of an actual physical book with a story like this, for sure. And you know, I wanted to go back to uh, the veil template that you had mentioned earlier, because we're kind of working through the book chronologically here. And, and after you talk about the Arcadian shepherds and, and that mystery, you circle back to the veil template to sort of close a loop on two symbols that you say had puzzled you from the beginning. And we, we've already mentioned them, the turkey tracks and the stars. And I'm just curious if there's anything more to say about them here, because you said that the turkey track had been the hardest symbol to sort of crack during this whole thing. And is there anything more to say about that here? Or did we cover that pretty well already? We did, but I can say more. There, uh, the symbols in this, and an entire like the veil, the uh, the template itself, one one cell of the veil template, which used to be known as the KGC template. All the symbols in it point back to the tree of life symbolism. It contains its own tree of life symbolism through the uh, turkey track symbols. It also ties in with other symbols and beliefs: the uh, uh, joining of male and female, the astrological body, you know, uh, the different planets and constellations. It all ties in and falls back together. It's like at some points you'll think, well, I'm, you know, I'm getting really outside, far outside the box. And then you'll find something that takes it from that point right back to the heart of the whole thing, which ties in with the tree of life. The veil can also, Alistair Crowley had mentioned that the veil was uh, on a tarot card. Indra's net is used. I believe it was Indra's net on, or, or actually it's the priestess card in the tarot card. She's holding a net which is representative. It falls back in with Fulk and Ellie's descriptions. And it also ties in with uh, the veil, which is a symbol of the division between the terrestrial and the celestial. It's blowing my mind thinking of it, revisiting all this, but it uh, ties in with the physical and the spiritual. And the, the treasures also reflect the same thing, in my opinion. I think most of the treasures and historical sites on the veil template are more of a world, just a, uh, financial, you know, like gold and silver and wealth. Whereas I think the treasures that exist in the, the tree of life template are more of a spiritual and historical value. So all the meanings, the tree of life, uh, the turkey tracks all tie in, but 
Also, another point on the turkey tracks. Recently, I was dis- I discovered that along the uh, Camino de Santiago in Spain and France, there's some ancient, ancient churches that were built, many of them on top of old pagan sites of worship. The scallop shell that represents, you know, the pilgrimage, that, that's all, that all ties in with Venus, Mercury, Jesus and Mary. And it also ties in, in some of those old churches, there's a track, there's a mark in some of those old churches that looks identical to, to the turkey track, only over there they call it a goose track. And the goose was known to have been a sacred animal to Venus. It's like the whole thing, you, you feel like you're going way out of bounds, and then it falls right back in line with all the other research I've done. It's just been an amazing journey, and it continues to amaze me. Yeah, me too. And there's one more piece here that I want to touch on before we summarize essentially everything. But you mentioned uh, petroglyphs as potentially playing a role in your treasure hunt here as well. Tell the audience a bit about which petroglyphs you were looking at out there, I believe in the Southwest, and you know where they were located and how exactly they did tie into your research. Oh, like the uh, Los Lunas Decalogue stone, I believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it had ancient Hebrew writings. On, on a stone that had existed, they, they said pioneers had asked some of the, the local Native Americans, they'd been asked about this. A lot of people thought for a while that, that it, the Hebrew stones or the Hebrew markings on these stones could have been uh, attributed to what they called crypto Jews who came over when uh, Spain was here. You know, when Spain first, dis- you know, when they were doing their explorations and, and looking for the lost cities of gold. A lot of the Jewish people had come over. They wanted away from all the persecution, and it was a, a you know a, a fresh start for them. Maybe they could find some peace. So a lot of people attributed it attributed the uh, petroglyphs to Jews who came over with the Sp- Spanish. But the Indians had said that those markings had been there before they were there, and they didn't know who they you know who who had done it. So that that ties a lot. And not not only that, the, those petroglyphs line up on the veil template perfectly. So it lends more evidence, in my opinion, that it ties in with some of the ancient, uh, well, the Templar and the people who brought these treasures over. Another important thing I wanted to say, I keep I've got so many topics trying to come together at the same time. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Freemasons, through all this research and the, the tree I had mentioned, with all the people who tie in like a family tree back to the Templar, in my opinion, I, I show a lot of great evidence that the Freemasonic Templar are the direct heirs and legitimate heirs of the original Knights Templar. Uh, we know there's a lot of groups of Templar around the world, but and they ever they all claim to be descended from the original Templar. But I, I believe through this research, I've shown very well that the the Freemasons and the Masonic branch of the Templar are the legitimate heirs of the original Templar. And I hope I answered your question. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I think you did. And like you said, there's just so many different research strands to try to tie together here. But we are essentially, I mean, we're at the end of the book, chronologically speaking. So I just want to summarize what you learned from this story, what you actually think you discovered, and where it's taken you, I guess, since you finished the manuscript here. Okay. What I learned from it, it, it's it's hard to even explain what I learned from it. The, all this research, the Kabbalah, the the different cultures, different religions, different forms of Kabbalah, it opened my mind a lot towards other beliefs and how they all seem to tie back to one common or a certain common theme from, you know, the Egyptians, the Jews, Christians, Muslims, Gnostics, all these different beliefs all seem to have a lot in common described in different symbols or portrayed in different names and symbols. Uh, a lot of these symbols also, um, Kabbalah is also after just all the discoveries, it's a very beautiful practice in my opinion, but it's also very good at using, if you know it, to hide messages that no one else would ever see. I, I feel like I am very fortunate to have stumbled on this and to have actually found the answers to all m- most of my questions. I also think, you know, as I mentioned, I, I also believe after all of this, that the, uh, the Freemasons and the, the Masonic Templar are the legitimate heirs of the original Knights Templar. And I think they're the custodians of ancient knowledge, treasures, and other artifacts that if all led out at once, I think it would, it would cause a lot of trouble f- 
it may, you know, it may be hard for some people to accept. They don't want to cause any, you know, cause any rifts or waves, but it, this is information that over time, I think they release when the time is right and it helps humanity as a whole. So my last question for you then, Dan, is, you know, we talked a lot about treasures in terms of actual gold, maybe jewels, you know, things like that. But is there a chance that, you know, some of these treasures that you're talking about, that these maps were made to lead people toward, that they're not physical treasures, that they may be more, you know, like texts that relate to alchemical traditions or occult traditions or Gnostic yeah. or Kabbalistic or whatever the, the school of belief is. Like, are we talking about treasure in an actual sense here at some point, or are we more talking about treasures in like an, I guess, like an esoteric or spiritual sense? I think it's all of the above. I know there's physical, traditionally, you know, traditional types of treasure like silver and gold. I know that is, exists in, in a lot of these. I think that's mostly on located on the veil template. But yeah, on the tree of life template, I believe the treasures, um, I believe there's physical treasures. And I also believe. There's spiritual treasures and treasures that would just exist in the form of knowledge in ancient texts, historical documents, and things of that nature. I think a lot of the texts and historical documents and even the spiritual treasures that could be involved that are, I believe, are involved in this. I think a lot of those could change a lot of people's minds on, you know, on the truth of a lot of it would probably add to most religions. But at the same time, you know how people get when you mention religion. I mean, the quickest way to start a fight in any crowd is to start talking about politics or religion. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a hurdle people need to get past before some of these truths can be known or some of those treasures can be revealed. Uh, I, I don't really know. And I'm not going to even pretend to know. That's just my theory on that, on why some of them need to remain hidden for now. But I, I do think over time, hopefully in our lifetime, a lot of these will be revealed. Well, that's a, a great answer and a, a great way to wrap up a great story here that you've put into book form for everybody to wade through and I guess, you know, maybe inspire them to go on their own treasure hunt of sorts, right? So, yeah. Dan, tell people where they can find the book if they're interested in reading it. Yeah, it's available through Inner Traditions, and you can go to their website, innertraditions.com. It's available at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, and literally anywhere books are sold. So around the world. So, you, I mean, I've even seen uh, bookstores holding it in Africa, Australia, Kuwait, and different, a, a lot of different places. So if you'd like to get the book, you can get it just about anywhere. Absolutely. And where can people keep up with you personally if they're interested oh, in following you? Yeah, uh, my website is authordanduke.com. Uh, you can also type in author Dan Duke on uh, Twitter or Facebook, Instagram, and even Tumblr. So I, I recently found out about Tumblr. So <laughs> I've kind of been like a, living like a hermit for the last 20 years doing all sure. this research. So I, I didn't really, I, I may, maybe I should be embarrassed to, to admit that I just now found out about Tumblr. But <laughs> oh, I don't think that's embarrassing at all. So that's, that's totally cool. I actually would be better off if I didn't know what Tumblr was. <laughs> so, but anyways, Dan, yeah, really appreciate your time for real. I know you're busy. I know you've been giving a lot of talks here about the book. So it means a lot to me for you to come on the show and tell us a bit about it. So thanks again so much. It was really a joy to, to talk to you about this story. Thanks for the opportunity. And I'm very honored to have been on your show. And there you have it. My thanks again to Daniel Duke. If you were paying attention, Dan did kind of spoil my last question there several minutes prior to me asking if the nature of these treasures was maybe more metaphysical than physical. And a good interviewer would have steered clear of that question and not asked it. Maybe made up something else on the spot. But I am not a good interviewer, so I doubled down on it because I think that angle into these stories is actually worth reiterating. Mostly because I, myself, am not entirely sure that these treasures aren't just physical. Take the government land comment, the military base comment that I made early in the chat into account. Take the idea that religion and now greater spirituality is often used as just another indoctrination and distraction tool. And I think you have another possible wrinkle to this story and others like it. Yes, the quest for spiritual truth is exciting and enticing and enlightening and empowering. But you can search during this lifetime for all those hidden invisible truths and I don't think the powers that be are going to stop you. Why would they? They're hoarding all the gold and silver and jewels and trinkets and whatever other wealth you can imagine in their underground caves and bunkers. 
I don't know, maybe I'm too cynical these days, but that right there would be a hell of a magic trick on their part. That's some of that uh, Ocean's Eleven misdirection type shit. Anyway, a shout out to new patrons, Nathan, Amanda, Peter, Vetle, Donald, and Rue. My apologies if I mispronounce any of your names there. Hey, if you're interested in joining these fine folks and supporting the show during its final episodes here, patreon.com slash oldculture is the place to do so. I think there's seven episodes left now, so get in while you can. The archive will stay online uh, for a bit after the show ends, so even if you just want to hop on board now, you'll still have access to it for several more months. So, patreon.com slash oldculture. Anyway, I uh, am at the beginning stages of a new podcast endeavor that I'm not quite ready to talk about yet, but I am to the point where I am finalizing the format of the podcast and building out a Patreon for that coming up with logo designs and merch designs and all that other stuff that's just, you know, tactical and whatever. But no news yet to share, but there's some stuff churning here, and hopefully I'll be able to talk about it very soon. So until then, though, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, question authority, and pray for Amazonia. <laughs> Please rewind this cassette.